Good afternoon, Year 8. That little bit of music there to start us off was quite famous. Hopefully you've heard it before. It was Rule Britannia. And it's going to link in with what we are looking at today in our first lesson back after Easter. So our title for today's lesson is Ruling the Waves. And what you uh, need to do as we go through is you need to make some notes. I'll stop and pause at different stages and maybe ask you some questions and make some notes on that. But what we're thinking about is, well, how does the Navy grow in power? which means that um, they are able to rule the waves, control the seas, and therefore help Britain become the empire that it was. Okay, we've looked at a few case studies of the empire, now we're going to see the role of the navy. So let's, I'll read it and you can follow along as we go. British merchants, oops. British merchants needed the Royal Navy to protect them from foreign attacks so they could trade safely with Britain's overseas colonies. What this means, Traders, the people who were in business, needed to make sure that the navy protected them. Because if not pirates and other people um, could get in the way and take the goods and therefore undermine their ability to make profit. As an island nation, Britain had been proud of its navy. However, by the 1740s, the Royal Navy was in a dire condition. Okay? It was in a bad condition and suffered a string of embarrassing defeats at the hands of the French and the Spanish. The man charged with reforming, improving, making better the Royal Navy, was a battle-hardened admiral called George Anson. Made first Lord of the Admiralty in 1751, Anson introduced sweeping reforms. He took control of the Marines uh, from the army, giving the Royal Navy a crack force of soldiers who could fight on both land and sea. He also introduced a uniform for naval officers consisting of a blue coat and white breeches, and he greatly increased naval discipline. This new level of discipline was revealed in 1756 when Admiral Byng lost Britain's important Mediterranean colony of Menorca. Back in England, the 52-year-old Admiral was shot by firing squad. So under Anson, the Navy is reformed, is improved, okay? Um, and that's best highlighted by sort of the fate of Admiral Byng, who loses Menorca. And as a result of this, when he returns to England, he thinks, oh, it's going to be okay. He actually gets shot by firing squad, so executed, okay, for his failure. Most importantly, Anson persuaded the British, uh, the British government to invest in a new and state-of-the-art ships. So you've got the best technology around. Britain's enormous dockyards in Portsmouth, Plymouth, Deptford and Chatham employed thousands of men, building large 74-gun battleships for naval wars and smaller 36-gun frigates for scouting and protecting the merchant ships. The 104-gun HMS Victory, which was launched in 1765, took 6,000 trees to build. So this is similar, in a way, to the work we're doing in geography, where we're looking at deforestation. This was happening in Britain at the time, but we're using this um, tree, these trees to build our, our boats. Okay, and We've got different types of boats. We've got the um, battleships with large guns, and then the frigates, which are slightly more nimble, and they can um, protect the merchant ships as we go. It says the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War began in 1756 and was the world's first truly global conflict. The war was mainly fought between Britain and France, but fighting spread across the world to their colonies. Battles were fought in North America, the Caribbean, Africa and India, where Robert Clive wins victory at Plassey in 1757. If you can remember that from a few weeks ago. In 1759, Britain launched an attack on Quebec, the capital of the French possession in North America, um, part of present-day Canada. With the help of the Royal Navy, 4,600 troops uh, under the leadership of General Wolfe sailed up the St. Lawrence River towards Quebec at night. On the 13th of September, they took the city in a surprise attack. General Wolfe was killed, but his victory gave um, Britain almost complete control in North America. Okay. Then finally, this bit links in with our slavery topic. Sailors who did not follow orders risked being flogged by the cat and nine tails, a whip made of nine knotted leather cords designed to cut the skin. So what we're here is a picture of the HMS Victory, which has been restored. It's down in, in Portsmouth, so maybe one day you can go down and have a look at that. Finally, we've got a picture of the cat and nine tails here. As we can see, it's got the knots in the end. Okay, we talked about them when we did our slavery topic and how they were designed to puncture and, and pierce the skin to make things worse. And then a picture there of how this sort of punishment would be doled out. The sailor, who's obviously got the rules wrong, is tied up on the um, on the rack and then he's being whipped in front of the rest of them. 
like we can see, everybody's been made to watch, send that message, like when we talked in slavery about it. What I want you to do is pause and can we answer these three questions? Full sentences. How did Anson improve the Navy? Anson improved the Navy by. And there's at least three things you can get for this one. Why is the Seven Years' War sometimes considered the First World War? Came it all the first global war? So again, the Seven Years' War is considered a global war because. And the Cat and Nine Tales tells about the Navy because. So pause, pause and get them three questions written, please. Uh, three answers written, sorry. Let's just recap the start of the Seven Years' War before we move on. So the Seven Years' War began in 1756 and was the world's first truly global conflict. The war was mainly fought between Britain and France, but fighting spread across the world to their colonies. Battles were fought in North America, the Caribbean, Africa and India, where Robert Clive won his famous Battle of Placid. In 1759, Britain launched an attack on Quebec, okay, which is in modern-day Canada, the capital of the French possessions in North America, part of present-day Canada. With the help of the Royal Navy, 4,600 troops under the leadership of General Wolfe sailed up the St. Lawrence River towards Quebec at night. On the 13th of September, they took the city by a surprise attack. General Wolfe was killed, but his victory gave Britain almost complete control in North America. Later on that year, on the 20th of November, the Royal Navy defeated the French Navy off the coast of France at the Battle of Cuberon Bay. The French were planning to invade Britain, but the Royal Navy intercepted a fleet of 27 ships. Six French ships were destroyed and one was captured. The Royal Navy went on to capture Havana and Manila, Havana in Cuba, Manila in the Philippines, and the Spanish and a number of French islands in the Caribbean. When the Treaty of Paris was signed with the French in 1763, Britain had expanded its power in India, taken French territories in North America, the Caribbean, and retained its power in the Mediterranean by keeping Gibraltar and Menorca. The end of the Seven Years' War marked the beginning of Britain's global dominance, which had lasted 150 years. At the root of this dominance lay the Royal Navy. By 1800, the British had 285 major battleships in service around the world, more than the French, Spanish, Dutch and Danish fleets combined. Okay? So that's a staggering number, isn't it? They have 285 major battleships, okay, and then that's more than French, Spanish, Dutch, and Danish fleets combined. Okay, what's the key here is the idea that the power of the navy has allowed Britain to dominate the seas, to control the seas, and it's the seas that allow things to move around up here. Okay, little Britain up here, tiny little pink country. Okay, but we control all this other land that is pink. Okay, and that's because we have the Royal Navy. Okay, we can stop the French moving around. What's really important, some things to notice. We look at France. Okay, France has um, France's navy has to be split because they've got sort of an exposure on two sides. They've got the Atlantic here, and they've also got the Mediterranean here. Okay, so the French need to split their fleet. Okay, and then to get them through, they need to get through this really small bit here, which you can just about make out, which is Gibraltar. Okay, that's British. So we control that really tiny bit of narrow bit of land. That kind of creates a pressure point. We also have, as we can see, outposts everywhere else. Okay, so we've got the Falkland Islands all the way down here, which we had a war about in the 1980s. The reason we want them is to make sure we can keep our um, navy supplied as they move around. Another really interesting point to think about is this bit here. Okay, So nowadays this bit here is called the Straits of Malacca, um, next to Malaysia. It's a narrow strait and what it does is it allows you to trade from India down to the rest of this part of the world. If we think about in modern day trade, the Chinese are trying to get control of this because this allows them to get their goods to their markets around here. So this re bit of um, land here is really highly protected. We look here, okay, another tiny little bit of land, okay, or a tiny little bit of sea, that's heavily contested and heavily fought. The reason we want these areas near it, so A, we can trade, but we can also control and influence what goes through them seas. Later in history, um, a canal is going to be dug here, okay, and in fact I'll put that in blue so we can see it, okay, a canal, so a, a waterway, so we've got the Suez Canal, and it's going to allow us to quickly move our goods through here. That will mean if we want to get to India, we can go around here, through past Gibraltar, through the Mediterranean, 
down through here a lot quicker. Before that, before this is built, what we need to do is we need to go all the way around here, all the way up um, around the south of Africa. South of Africa. Now, one problem with the south of Africa, and I'll put this in purple, okay, is around here, okay, you've got really high winds. So if you come, you come down here and you come too far south, you're caught in them winds and it can take you off course. So this sort of advance or this, that's going to take place up here will transform um, all of that. But it's the key is the Navy is powerful and the Navy allows us um, to control the world. So finally, let's have a think about what it was like to be a seaman, what it was like to be in the Navy. The Navy grew from around 12,000 men during the early 18th century. 85,000 men in 1763 and 150,000 men by 1815. Okay, so from 12,000 to 85,000 to 150,000. It is growing massively and it's growing quickly. Naval ships could go for months without touching dry land, so it was impossible to eat fresh food. Seamen lived off a diet of meat preserved in salt and dry biscuits, which were often riddled with worms and insects. The lack of vitamin C in a sailor's diet but many suffered from scurvy, a disease which caused their gums to rot, teeth to fall out, and bodies to become covered in ulcers. Scurvy caused far more seamen than active combat duty during the 18th century. Okay, so soldiers, obviously some would die in war, but more were being killed as a result of the poor diet. Recruiting enough men to join the Navy could be difficult, so press gangs visited towns and cities along the British co um, coasts and forced sailors to join, or forced sailors to join. So press gangs because they pressed them into joining. Okay, one common way this sometimes happened was they'd go into a bar or a pub um, and they'd be very generous, they'd be, you know, oh yeah, the beers, the beers, beers, beers. And then what they'd then do is they'd say, right, for one more beer, all I want you to do is say you'll take the king's shilling, say you'll, shut, you'll sign up. So they'd effectively get the people drunk, press them into joining up and force them into joining the Navy. When the person woke up the next morning, they'd made this promise, oh my gosh, and then they were enlisted. However, service in the Royal Navy did hold some opportunities. When an enemy merchant ship was captured, prize money would be shared out among the crew and the naval seamen uh, liked to flaunt their wealth with colourful clothing and gold earrings. Royal Navy seamen were named Jack Tars. Some would cover their arms in naval tattoos, practice learnt from the tribe people Captain Cook in, uh, encountered in Tahiti, and their drink of choice was rum. Made from Caribbean sugar, British sailors were entitled to a ration of half a pint of rum a day. So the sugar, we remember from our last topic, um, the sugar at this stage is um, still it's on its way of being stopped, being grown by slaves. But sugar has become a major export. And one of the reasons it's so important is because the Navy love it because it keeps, you know, keeps them in spirits, okay? which means that they can fight. So finally, what I need you to do is you need to go on to um, follow the link you've been sent by um, the teacher in your email to the quiz that will take you to forms. When you're on there, what you need to do is answer the seven short questions and the three long questions. Long questions are here. Okay, so you can prep before you go on to the forms. Why was the Royal Navy in need of reform? The Royal Navy needed, it was in need of reform after the 1740s because how did the end of the Seven Years War mark the start of Britain's role as a global power? And what were the benefits and drawbacks? So for question three, you're looking for one sentence as a benefit, one sentence as a drawback. Make sure you complete them on forms. That will, that's your work you need to hand in this week. That's it for now. I'll speak to you soon. All the best and stay safe.